Test, test. Can you guys hear me okay? Good. Good morning. Thanks for joining us on your early lunch break. Uh, welcome to ICAST and welcome to this lunch and learn session about angler motivations and 2020 sport fishing trends. Where we are now and where do we go from here? I'm Stephanie Vadalero. I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing Communications at the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. You may know us for our Take Me Fishing campaign, and if you were at the breakfast this morning, you saw Frank Peterson um, talk about what we've accomplished this year. Um, I'm excited to be here with Rob Southwick. Uh, we use a lot of data in our campaigns, and uh, I'm gonna be presenting to you this morning some of the findings from our special report on fishing, which we do every year, and also um, a special one-time study we did this year on our newcomers who came in in 2020. Rob? All right, thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Good to see everybody. So I'm Rob Southwick, company of Southwick Associates. We've been do, do, uh, excuse me, doing data research in the sport fishing, hunting, outdoor sector for over 30 years now. It's been focused on this sector here, especially in sport fishing. We work for companies individually. Um, we also do a lot of work on behalf of ASA for about over 25 years where we operate the data and statistics arm of the association to help people like you understand what is going on in this industry. And a lot of information we have on anglers' needs, groups like RBFF put to work. So it's an honor to speak with you up here today. People actually get the work done with the data that we produce. So i um, glad you all could be here. And what we'll do is we'll share a lot of the public information we have that explains what happened in the past year and forward. But before we really get into it, we're gonna kind of keep it somewhat informal, but just wanna get an idea who's here. How many here are retailers? So, okay, so third. Okay, manufacturers? I thought the rest of the room. Media? A few media? Okay. Sales reps? Okay. Do we miss anybody? All right. We've got a heckler up <laughs> and here. And a heckler up front. All right, so if we throw rocks, we'll throw them back. Okay, well, you. Okay. Well, Take it away. I see a lot of familiar faces. I'm happy to see you here. Thanks for coming. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, what we're going to cover today, uh, first off, we're going to talk about uh, trends in participation, what we saw in 2020. Uh, we're going to talk about angler personas. Uh, this is who makes up our current angler base and who makes up that newcomer base. We'll go into some more details on that. And we're going to talk about why they fish, what motivates them to go out there on the water. Uh, Rob is going to talk about some tackle market trends, and then we'll both give you some information about what we see for 2021, where we think participation and sales are going. So as most of you in this room know and probably experienced yourselves, uh, 2020 was kind of the perfect storm for participation. Um, while we were all going through our hardships personally, uh, people really flocked to the outdoors, and fishing saw a huge boost. As you can see from the chart, um, we had 5 million additional people go fishing in 2020. That's a 10% increase. Uh, boating also saw a boost. There was a 13% increase in new boat sales. Now, our BFF and our Take Me Fishing campaign, we're really focused on getting those newcomers into the sport. And the people that we see as growth audiences uh, really had strong increases in participation. So this is really encouraging for us. Uh, we had 13.5 million youth go fishing. That's the highest rate since 2007. And it's up about 2 million from the year prior. We had 19.7 females go fishing in 2020. That's the highest level recorded to date. 4.8 million Hispanics, that's an all-time high for that segment, and it's double the number since 2007. And 3.1 million African Americans, uh, that's up about a million in the last 10 years. We also saw a really big increase in the number of new participants to fishing. As you can see on the chart, we went from about 3.1 to 4.4 million and we reactivated a lot of folks. And what that means is they used to fish, but maybe they haven't gone in a long time. Uh, it went from 6.9 all the way up to 9 million. So these are all fantastic indicators uh, that new audiences, this new generation of anglers are coming on board. 
but, there's always a but, right? Uh, we still have an issue with retention. Uh, if you take a look at this chart, uh, going back to 2017, and that was a pretty typical uh, number at that time, we had you know, millions of people come in, but about 5.6 million dropping out. Well, over the last three years, that number has really increased, um, which is concerning to us and now shows a trend. We had hoped in 2020 we wouldn't lose people at quite that high of a rate, but we had 8.8 .8 million laps out of the sport. And what's, you know, who makes up that group? Um, we had people lapse from all age groups, but the one that showed the most was ages 55 and plus. So folks are aging out of the sport, um, and we need to start really filling that funnel with the newcomers. Now I'm going to turn it over to Rob. All right, thank you. I want to take, take a moment here to share with you a new tool that is available to you to use. Uh, it's a licensed dashboard that is available on ASA's website. This is a project that is run by American Sport Fishing Association on behalf of a larger partner of organizations, including the RBFF, um, National Shooting Sports Foundation, there's many organizations there, and especially state fish and wildlife agencies have generously provided a grant using the excise taxes that this trade pays on fishing tackle sales. What this dashboard does is we have 25 state agencies directly sharing their license data with us. It sounds like something, gee whiz, we should have done years ago, and maybe we should have, but a lot of you know, data privacy laws and issues to overcome. We're finally making this happen, so this program is growing. And it gives us in-depth insights, not a survey, but actual quantified numbers, total licenses sold. Like every tool, there's always you know, limitations to it. So you need to be like surveys and limitations. This does too. We don't have the youth, because kids don't need to have licenses, or seniors. But for the licensed buyers, the 16-year-olds, 65-year-olds, we have great information. And what we know is last year in 2020, total license sales increased over 13%. And that's great. The total number of anglers increased a little bit more. You see that? Especially because of youth. I'll come back to that in a minute. But for the licensed buying group, big increase. But the real story comes into play when you dig down into the numbers further. And what we see is that the drive, which you can Stephanie alluded to there, was female participation grew at a much, much greater rate than among men. Well, we can speculate as to why, and the first speculation is, well, these are maybe moms that want to take their kids out fishing. We've seen a lot of, kids, you've probably seen it too, more kids out fishing along ponds, and the moms want to go along with them, get them out of the house for a little bit. But I really think it's a little bit more than that. We're running some surveys this year. We should have some insights by early next year. But great growth rate um, with women's participation last year in fishing. Uh, we know that through this data that people bought their license earlier. So we saw a huge spike in May and license sales, but then the increases were negligible in August. Well, look at the people who bought it, people had more time on their hands, so they bought their licenses earlier in the year, they went more often, so what happens? That drove sales of disposable ta fish and tackle. So your increases for line, hooks, lures, grew at a greater rate than the more durable products. Come back to that in a moment. And then as mentioned, the younger anglers came in stronger. So for fishing licenses, that's just the 16 year olds, the 24 year olds, that younger cohort saw the greatest growth rate. When you get to the older cohorts, growth rates were a lot lower. Well, this is really, really good because we've seen in the past in a few years, the growth rates for younger anglers was not that strong. It really peaked last year. This bodes well for the future and the challenges now, we've got to retain them. So you can keep hearing that from us. That is critical and we need your help to keep our customers fishing and buying tackle. So here's where you go. Take a picture of that screen if you want, or just go to the ASA webpage. It's very easy to find, but it's a free tool. We'll be updating it in September with the sales breakdowns for the first six months of this year. You get information by region, by state, and, and other breakouts, residency and more. And then about this time next year, or a year and a half from now, we should have a real-time dashboard in place we're working on that now, working on the legal, getting rid of the legal hurdles so you can see license sales as of yesterday, not six months ago. So now you've heard about the big growth. We've got millions of new customers out there and you've seen the idea of the proportional changes. Let's talk about the reasons why they are fishing and this perfect storm came together last year. What caused that to happen? I will start by talking about our current anglers, people you already see in the stores and then Stephanie's gonna come up and talk about the growth potential. 
how do we get more people fishing? Because still a lot more room for growth out there. I've been doing this for 32 years now. And I'm convinced, and I'll argue with anyone, that we as an industry have for too long and too frequently talk about our customers as one homogenous group. We tend to describe them based on what they look like. Look around the room, 45-year-old white guys. Right? And that's who we sell to. I promise you, I promise you, no one has ever bought fish and tackle because they're a 45-year-old white guy. There's some kind of motivation, there's a need. There's some kind of need they want to satisfy by going fishing. And that varies by person. So if you took a room full of 45-year-old 40, white male anglers and you talk to them, you'll find out they're not the same. They want different experiences out of fishing. So we completed a study at the American Sport Fishing Association um, that breaks down our current anglers into these seven unique personas that describe their motivations for fishing. They're not based on what people look like. So don't ask me what female anglers want, because there's no simple answer. They're just as diverse as the white guys, right? So what we have are seven unique segments. I'm gonna to touch on two of them here, and then the report, I'll show you. Where you can, there's actually some printed copies in the back corner. Patrick, raise your hand. Yeah, by him, there's some um, reports in the counter down there you can grab, but you can also download it online. So the first of this, I'm gonna share two segments. The first one is the consumptive angler, kind of a stereotypical angler. By the, as the name implies, this person wants to bring home fish to eat. And only a minority of anglers really want to do that. But for this group, it's a primary goal. The second goal is to relax. And if you go to the report, we have detailed descriptions and stats for each one of these personas. They're based on science, not like, oh, that sounds good. It's based on the actual numbers. But in each one of these descriptions, we have a table here. If I don't fall off the stage, you see zero right there. This is the average angler. We put all the anglers together. So we can see how each persona differs from all other anglers. So the consumptive angler is above average for most motivations that we discover why people like to fish. We discover those through focus groups. But you see down here, they really, really over-index when it comes to catching fish for food. And then up that, you see things about relaxing. But you see here, too, that fishing is a part of their lifestyle. They've done it their whole life. Their family has done it. This is someone you really don't need to recruit. Their family is going to bring them in there. But still, you see what they want. You might find new product ideas. If you profile your own customers and you see you're missing this market, you know where you can expand. And if you're in the media, you know how to communicate them, to retain them, to keep them fishing. The next segment I want to share is the traditionalist. This is the person who's done everything fishing. You know this person. They're going to volunteer at youth fishing events. They're older conservation programs. Because for them, fishing is their life. Their life is their life but they're at a point they have more joy helping someone else catch their first fish. So they're about just over 10% of the market, another strong group. This is the only segment of the seven that over indices on everything fishing. So you see zero. There's other segments where most everything is negative. You'll see that in the report. So keeping it moving here, these are the other five segments. They're really distinctly different. The social dabbler right here, this is one that fishing, it's not really about fishing. They could take it or leave it. They want to spend time with their family. A lot of the moms you find in here, majority female in this segment right here. Fishing is a way that gives them fun social outdoor benefits. Well, fun social outdoor could be camping, could be hiking, could be a church picnic. Those are the, comp the items we're competing with to keep our anglers. Those are the activities that Jay was speaking about this morning. They're going to fight to get these people back. We've got to understand our anglers and meet, to meet them. And you've got the Zen angler. I, I kind of enjoy talking about this one here. The Zen angler, they want to just get away. And you can go fishing with the Zen angler, but don't talk. They just want to be left alone. So descriptions are in the report. Really neat stuff. Here's where you go to download the report, ASA's website. We thank the state fish and wildlife agencies for the support, the grant to do this research. It is here for you. Use this to grow your business and retain our anglers. I think the next one's yours. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the newbies, our newcomers. Um, it's interesting as you're going through all the details of those personas, a lot of those motivations apply to our newcomers too, or there's pieces of them, right? Good. The Zen, the... Uh, 
in terms of what it yeah, absolutely. people's socialization. So I'll just talk real briefly about our newcomers because they do look a little different than that 45 year old white male, even though they're <laughs> motivated differently, uh, that we have in the room today. Um, our newcomers, now RBFF goes after, we've done a lot of research to figure out who has the most potential growth and it's a group we've identified as active social anglers or families. Um, it's young families, ages 25 to 34, with kids in that kind of 6 to 12 age range um, who enjoy the outdoors with their kids and their social circles. These are people who love participating in activities so that they can post it on their Instagram page and get all kinds of love for it. Um, they have kids in the household, as I mentioned. It's a lot of women. It's Hispanic. It's African American. And the newcomers who came in in 2020 were uh, very younger, more diverse, as I mentioned earlier, and from urban areas. We're, we're starting to see folks in urban areas discover, and maybe this happened during the pandemic, that local pond or park that they didn't know about. Um, so we're doing a lot to engage with these groups using some new channels like BuzzFeed and Complex and Hulu. Um, because they are a different animal. Now, what motivates the new anglers to fish? Um, generally speaking, people want to escape the usual demands of life. Uh, they enjoy being close to nature, catching fish, and spending time with their family and friends. Uh, now, the couple of things that I have starred on here are specific to 2020, <laughs> right? Social distancing. Um, when folks are stuck in their houses, they are tired of being in this, you know, stuck inside all the time with the kids and not able to get out, this allowed them to do something that was safe and helped keep them sane. It helped people's mental health and wellness uh, to be able to go out fishing. So we did a lot of um, outreach and PR and we created a lot of content around that, um, engaged to those um, outdoor families. I'm gonna turn it back over to Rob for a few minutes to do tackle market trends. All right, thank you. Jay, watch out for the one floorboard back over there. <laughs> All right, so let's, we talked about why people fish and how those factors came together to cause a great spike in participation last year. But what does that mean to us? Why we're here at the show for business? Through a series of, of, of projects we have, papers, data sources, I'll share a few of those sources. Um, we know that overall retail sales of fishing tackle, core fishing tackle, not ancillary, um, like marine products or boats, but rods, reels, terminal tackle, um, marine clothes, uh, fishing clothing too, up 55%. This is phenomenal. We do have issues last year, but I, mean, I want to find the liar in the room. Did anyone ever expect to have a single year growth of 55% when you're not in the startup phase? I dare someone to raise their hand. I mean, it was a great, it's a great, great, fantastic year. Um, so let's look at what happened, what's going to happen after that. Um, so the typical independent retailer, through a survey we've done with the American Sport Fishing Association, we know the typical independent saw about a 30% increase in sales last year. As Glenn shared this morning, about 80% um, of them saw a 40% increase in sales. About 10% of retailers saw a decline. And those are t places typically, you know, that could be a concessionaire in a state park that was closed. You know, unique situations during the closures and COVID. But a strong year overall. Um, nine out of 10 had inventory issues. They couldn't make sales because they didn't have any product. Um, we heard about that quite a bit, but that really did not trickle down so much to the consumer. I'll come back to that point in a few moments. As mentioned before, because they fish more often, they started fishing earlier in the year, it was the disposable type of fish and tackle products that sold the most, had the greatest increases. Um, last year, with the increase we had 55%, we almost hit the $10 billion mark as an industry. Uh, I, I never thought we'd see that in our lifetime, my lifetime. Um, but we should break that this year, more of that in a minute. So significant size, this gives us a lot more clout as an industry, whether it's government affairs, talking to the, the business media, this is strong for us. Just gotta keep them fishing, keep it there. This market size information, that $9.7 billion, we do have details there. If you're an ASA member and you want the detailed report, if you want to learn about the size of your niche, could be soft lures, could be fluorocarbon lines, spinning reels, we have the market size all broken out there. 
contact Rob Russell at ASA. His email is there on the screen. He'll send you a copy of that report. If you're not an ASA member, um, you can join the ASA and get the report for free, or you can contact us at Southlink Associates and we provide the report for a fee. Hint to you, join ASA, a little better deal. So talking about what's next, what's gonna happen the rest of this year for 2020. It's yours. <laughs> what's happening next? I'll shut up and let's take I, I feel talk. like we're <laughs> dancing here. Is it my turn? Um, so you may have heard in, in other presentations, and I'm really just going to reinforce this here with some different sources that we have. Uh, there really is a huge opportunity for continued growth in 2021, and, and some of you are likely already seeing that. Um, we work with uh, Harris Poll, actually helped guide us through a lot of our uh, pandemic planning. We were watching uh, weekly consumer insights to find out you know, what, what's the sentiment this week, what are people doing, and how do we need to adjust our marketing. Um, you know, the more time thing, uh, Harris Poll really supports that consumer sentiment that um, people have, time has long been a barrier to fishing and boating participation, right? It's always one of the number one things that people say, I don't have time, I don't have yeah. time. And the pandemic really freed that up. Um, people were home, they couldn't do all of their regular going to the movies, going to concerts and whatnot. So um, it's still to some extent like that, things aren't 100% open, although they feel like it here in Florida. <laughs> if I could add to that comment right there, we see some more surveys too about the time issue. Time really means they have other priorities, things they prefer to do. So Saturday mornings, kids are going to soccer tournaments and games in the past. Last year they were not, so time came available. So when someone says they don't have time, that means you gotta dig deeper. They've got time still, 24 hours a day. We just now, they've learned fishing, Let's make that a higher priority in their life. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just not a priority. <laughs> it's an excuse. Exactly. Um, another stat, 69% of Americans came out of the pandemic with a renewed appreciation for the outdoors. Uh, people did spend time outdoors and they realized it was really beneficial to their lives. So they're, they're wanting more of it. Um, safety and sanity, 65% of Americans have turned to outdoor activities to stay both safe and sane, as I mentioned earlier. It helped a lot of us get through it. And a lot of folks, you know, canceled trips during the pandemic and saved up money and they are now ready to spend it. So we want to be right front and center so that when they're ready to spend it, we've got what they want. Um, in terms of future participation, uh, this is a study that we did on the 2020 newcomers. Uh, we asked people, how likely are you to go fishing again next year and to go boating again next year? And as you can see, there was a really strong response. Now, things change, right? Who knows if this will actually come true? But it's an indicator we can use to show that the strong interest in participation will continue through this year. And the other piece of data I wanted to share with you, um, takemefishing.org is kind of our central hub for all things uh, how-to information, where-to information. It's how we help people get out on the water. Um, we use that as a, as a measure of success. And if you look at the bottom line on this chart, that was 2019. We had 18 million visits to our digital properties the entire year, and that was a record high. But if you take a look at the line in the middle, 2020 brought us 54 million visits. It was really, really extraordinary, and it's how we knew it was going to be a big year. Uh, though we don't sell anything, you know, certainly that, that interest was there, and people were engaging with our content in a way they never have. Uh, well, if you look at that top line, uh, we're up 35% over 2020. So it looks like maybe there's a little bit of softening or flattening um, happening there, but certainly, for the first three months of our fiscal year, April, May, June, we're seeing super strong interest in fishing and boating. We've had almost 20 million visits in just three months. So all really good indicators that this year is going to um, continue to be great for our industry. And that's what we're seeing right now. So, you, so for the second quarter just ended this year, the excise tax is one of our regular metrics that everybody's got to pay the excise tax. 64% increase over the same period previous year. 
Well, remember, there's a delay. When you sell the, if you sell manufacture, you, know, you sell the product and you have X number of months until you have to pay the tax. So tax being paid in the second quarter really reflects participation, purchasing, excuse me, wholesale shipments to be precise in the first quarter. So we're comparing here to the first quarter last year before things really got nasty in COVID. But the point is, there's still, we still see a lot of activity going on at the wholesale shipment level, despite the inventory issues, there's still, you're not paying the tax, you're not shipping the product, you have it in the US. So it shows a lot of product going on there. So if people are talking about inventory issues, yes, that's a real problem. We've had a fantastic, 55% you know, increase last year, fantastic. If, if we had full inventory, maybe we could hit 70%. But when we talk to anglers, we ran over surveys last week and week before, and we asked them, are you seeing inventory issues? Can you buy the product that you want to go fishing? And about 35% are saying, I am noticing shortages. I can't get everything that I want. And then we asked them, okay, is that cutting back on your fishing time? Are you canceling trips or you know, doing something different? And they're saying no. Very, very few have had issues they can't go fishing. So the consumer is finding workarounds or finding substitutes. Instead of using a number four kale hook, maybe they went to a number two kale hook. It's maybe not what they wanted, but they're still fishing out there. So yes, inventory is a tough issue, but bottom line, we're still selling product and that is good. Now, if they have what they wanted, yes, they would have spent more. Especially our avid anglers, you know, they're committed to certain brands and models. They'll wait and buy the item later. They'll spend a little bit less to get them through for now. So yes, it's holding back sales, but it's not hurting our anglers out there on, in the ground. Um, couple points to bring through here is I wanna stress again that increased frequency. So the proportion of your buying that's composed of disposable items, lures, lines, and so forth, we expect that to continue in the future. So when you're doing your advanced planning, look at this year's proportions of retail purchases to continue going forward. And don't forget these new anglers, there's big growth going in there, especially at the independent level. I think it's a big opportunity for you. They don't know what to do. And they're very intimidated when they walk into the retailers. So we've seen that 30% growth of independent retailer level, but we know overall sales were at 55%. Where are they going? They're buying often online. They're going to the academies and dicks, places they're already comfortable with. They're looking for help there. So for the independent, be sure to promote yourself as a place to come meet the experts who want to help you. Use that persona research that we have to show your retail clerks. Make sure they read it and they understand the different motivations for the customers walking in the store. So when that customer walks in, your clerks know what to ask. What is it you want from fishing? Have you been before? If you haven't, welcome, we want you here. But make sure that your clerks understand that they want different types of services and they need it. That's more important now than ever. It's always been important, but it's critical now with this huge influx of new anglers. So I'll start Stop beating your Rob, could I jump stick. in on that for a second? Yeah, please. Yeah, I would totally second that. And, and all of our research says the same. These, these newcomers, they need really, really basic information. Stuff that you and I would be like, really, you don't know that? Like, that, what is a split shot? Like, they might get a shopping list from you of things to go, but they don't even know what that is. Explain to them what it is and how it helps enhance the fishing experience. Um, it's a different level of information. and. Frank, our president and CEO, is going to dive into the newcomer a little bit more tomorrow in a lunch and learn. If you're interested in that, um, come back. But, Great. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, we have a lot of information sources. Again, if you're an ASA member, you get a little bit more. A lot of the data are on the ASA website. At Southwick Associates, we have a lot of reports that we provide for a feed that show you sales by retail channel, sales by brand. Give us a call. Um, we can let you know what we have if you need more data. So what's gonna happen going forward? What's our prediction for sales from here on out? Participation's gonna remain strong. Is license sales are down about maybe two, two and a half percent compared to last year. But we had this phenomenal growth last year. So we've give, we're giving back a little bit this year, but frequency is still up there. I'm not worried about participation. It's gonna drive sales up. Logistics, that's gonna be the biggest problem still for at least the next six months till that works out. Um, you know, factories closing overseas again, getting containers back to refill. That's going to happen, but still a lot of product coming in. Consumers are still getting along okay. I'm not worried about trade wars anymore personally. That kind of went away after the election and after the, uh, everything else going on. Inflation may pop up a little bit in the short run, so, so our government folks tell us. But the price increases are really nominal. They're not going to affect 
the people who actually want to go fishing. So my prediction is we're going to see about upwards of a 10% increase in sales this year. We should break that $10 billion mark. After that, it looks like it should level out. So if you're doing your advanced planning a little bit more this year, after that, it should stay the same. I say by late 2022, 2023, what happens after that is up to us. If we work together to retain our anglers, it's gonna remain strong. If we don't work together, our customers are gonna go back to doing what they were doing before. So you've gotta get involved, contact the RBFF, do what you can to keep people fishing. Any points that we missed? I just wanna say, you, you did a very good job of pointing people where all your research was. And so <laughs> I wanted to mention that um, we also have a lot of free research uh, available to folks. If you want to head over to our newsroom at news.takemefishing.org, or we have a sign-up sheet in the back if you want to drop your email or a business card, we'd be happy to follow up with uh, more information for you. I do recommend the special report they put out every year. We use all the, the research at ASA and our own company too. That special report is very, very fascinating. It really gives you regular insights into those diverse audiences that we need to grow. I think we're good. I think we're good. Do we want to jump into questions? If there's any questions out there, anyone have any questions? Anyone yeah. have any questions? Well, well, let me get you a microphone here, please. All right. Thank you. Um, Matthew Cash from Cash and Fishing Rods. We're a U.S. based manufacturer. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, the dropout rates, and you're kind of seeing that trend over the past three years. Number one, how was that data compiled? How are you uh, obtaining that data? And then can you speculate on what might be causing those trends? You know, Robbie, you just mentioned that people might go back to what they were doing before pre-pandemic. Uh, so can you just talk to that a little bit? Thanks, Matthew. As there's actually two data sources. I'll speak to one. Stephanie can speak to the other. Um, once licensed data, then there would be a special report, I would assume. So for licensed sales data, as mentioned, we have, we've had, over the years, two sources. One was a quick survey we run of states every quarter asking them about their overall sales up or down. But that's now being replaced by states giving us their actual licensed data under very secure agreements, where we know the total population of licensed anglers, and this is the youth and the seniors, which they capture, but we know exactly who's dropping in, who's coming in, who's dropping out. So we know exactly who to survey. So what we're doing now is we're gonna go back and find a lot of these new female anglers, for example, um, people who quit a couple years ago and came back, or, or, you know, or new reactivated anglers, and we're gonna ask them what happened in 2020. So license sales data is the source we use for that dashboard that's now available with surveys of those individuals because we have permission with the states to do so. You wanna talk about your special report? Is this on? Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, so it really depends on uh, which cohort you're looking at as a segment of those who fill out, because there are different things. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Okay. We'll just keep tossing. It's all good. Uh, I was just saying, it really it depends on who you're looking at, because within the lapsed anglers, there are differences, of course. Um, but, you know, time. Uh, people this year, I believe the 2020 anglers, uh, some of the things they experienced were bad experiences uh, on the water. They didn't like the elements. Uh, maybe they didn't have the right clothing or the right equipment. Um, sometimes just having a bad experience, you know, trying to get your license um, can be a turnoff to folks. But if you dig into the research more, I encourage you to drop your name back here. Um, like women, for example, that's a group that they don't see themselves in the sport. So they come in at a really, really, really high rate and they drop out because they don't feel like they belong. They don't see themselves in catalogs, they don't see themselves on websites, and they're like, yeah, this isn't for me. So it's kind of different depending on who you're looking at, but it can be everything from a bad experience to just not identifying with it. Another point too, I forgot about the second part of your question. We often see in the surveys that people still want to fish. They'll tell us that they're an angler Though you dig down further, you see in the license data, they haven't bought a license in five or six years. So it's still a very popular activity, or right in the top three. But what happens, fishing is a very, very social activity. So it could be their kids, it could be their friends. You may want to go fishing, but when you're talking to the rest of the group on Thursday night, hey, what do you want to do this weekend? Hey, there's axe throwing competition. Cool. 
because remember, people fish because it's social, it's fun, it's outdoors, and if the people they want to hang out with mention another activity, we lose a customer. We've got to constantly keep it top of mind with them that the best fun social outdoor activity is fishing. There's all the extra benefits. And there's many other reasons too, but shoot me an email and I can get you the reports on that if you want. Uh, Matt Ellis, I'm an uh, <clears throat> inventory and demand planner in the fishing tackle industry. Uh, first of all, it's just great to be able to, it's great to be able to share a microphone with my fellow anglers and be in the same room <laughs> after being off for a year. Uh, two, two quick questions. Your last slide said expect the biggest growth in electronics. Oh. Uh, f first question of that is where is that, is that coming from uh, logistical issues or is that with, uh, with avid anglers versus the you know the, the more introductory anglers the the new demographics we saw that are getting in here are they going to be more involved with complicated electronics you know you're talking about how a lot of new new novice anglers are really maybe intimidated by a lot of the complex baits that you may see out here in the industry but getting into simpler things are they expected to be into the, into the Electronics, and the second no. question is the overall growth. Do you expect this uh, new industry we're in with Amazon getting more involved with lures and more online order and a lot of direct to consumer business? Do you think that is going to be the biggest uh, benefit to retain it, a lot of these anglers? It, it's, they're also different. Um, those new groups are not looking by electronics. Electronics are being primarily driven by those who are using boats, right? Not necessarily ice fishing, and there's others out there, some great new electronics and new product showcase. Um, but with the big surge in boat sales, what, like 30, 40%, 30, 30, 13%, huge number of the growth rate in, in boating. So all these new boats, people want to update. They have money they want to spend, as Stephanie mentioned. So people who are not getting new boats want to update their own electronics. They're ready to get back out there. Logistics would be the biggest issue right there right now. But it's, there's newcomers, no. They want a cane pole and a can of worms. And that's all you want to push on them. This new field. Let them evolve and grow into wanting these other products. If you give them success when they're younger, they're going to come back and want more new experiences and they'll migrate to buying electronics. But your electronics are your current anglers. But that's what consumers are telling us. What they're going to buy next year, the electronics is way off the charts. Yeah, I would just, I would support that by saying, you know, the folks who are coming in, they want that. They need the basics, basics, basics. However, um, I was talking with uh, Jeff Kolosinski with uh, Johnson yeah. Outdoors, and because they have electronics, they did a very basic how-to videos on YouTube on how to use every single feature of their products. Because if you are a newcomer, and maybe you're just interested in technology in general, uh, but you, know, you don't know what you're looking at. <laughs> so that's a very great way to approach newcomers with that kind of technology. Anything else? I don't know how we are in time. We'll stick around a little bit longer on the side. Um, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Have a great show. Thanks so much. Okay.